Year's resolution. Uh, I decided that I was going to write a book. Spoilers. Uh, so I signed up to Lean Pub and I paid the fee and I had this really clear picture in my mind of what my book was going to be and I remember sitting down on the first day and just being like, I am so writing a book right now, this is amazing. And I wrote the introduction and I, my husband came home that night and I was like, I'm writing a book, this is so cool. And then uh, the next day I had a moment where I literally went to Google and typed in, how long should a book be? <laughs> and like, how are you supposed to write a book? Um, and I realized that I actually had no idea what I was doing. I think New Year's resolutions are really dangerous things, kind of like milestone birthdays, where you set these goals in, like, for reasons that f escape me. Um, you have no proven skill in these areas, like writing a book or running a marathon. We just kind of assume that um, we are capable of these things, and it's only once we start we realise that there's hidden complexity or difficulty to it. So we can all write. Like a six-year-old child can write their name, probably. Um, you can write, hopefully. Uh, your favourite novelist can write. Um, everyone is a writer in some sense, but it's a spectrum, right? And there's a difference between being able to write and being able to write well. And I think we set these kind of goals, these New Year's resolution or milestone birthday type of goals, when we can kind of imagine our success at that higher level because we already have some basic skill. Like, we can already write, so how hard can it really be to kind of write a novel? Like, it's just a little bit further along that path, right? So you're probably not setting New Year's resolutions about testing. Um, but I hope that all of you are doing some form of testing in your roles right now like you're hopefully checking that your product works. So yay, you're a tester. Um, but there are levels of literacy in testing, just as in writing. And I think that there's a problem in our industry where people who test in any capacity think that they're amazing novelists. And they kind of overestimate their ability and they imagine themselves to be at the highest level of testing skill. And this doesn't come across as like overt arrogance. Like I don't see a whole lot of people walking around the office being like, I am the best tester ever. Um, but it's more that people kind of assume there's nothing for them to learn about testing. And they hold this kind of narrow view of what testing is and what their role is in it. And they're not really interested in finding out anything else. It's kind of a passive arrogance. Um, testers are explorers. And even if you're kind of sitting there thinking, I know how to test, I'd like to invite you to assume that your level of test literacy is something like this. So this is a girl who's digging for some kind of shellfish on the beach. She's an explorer, she's trying to find something. Um, you can see her here, she's got her head down, she's digging in one spot, she's got a little tool next to her that she may be using to help her, and she's definitely finding stuff, like there's things in that bucket. Like I said, you're probably all doing some kind of testing in your role, um, but I'd like to propose that the testing you're doing might be the equivalent of this, where you're kind of digging in one spot with one tool. Um, you're probably still finding problems in your products by doing this. Like, she's still got shellfish. Um, but what I want to encourage you to do in this talk is to move around a bit, um, pick up different sticks, or at minimum, at least recognise that there are options for you to move around and to pick up different sticks. Uh, so what I wanted to start with is why. Like, why am I talking to you about this and why do I want you to do this? It's important for you to improve your testing literacy because testing is part of your role. And I mean like testing and not just testing. So if you're not a tester, this expectation 
that testing as part of your role is something that's kind of arrived with Agile, with DevOps. It might not have been something that you've been expected to do before. So I talk a lot about this in the testing community from a test perspective, how testing is changing. In a waterfall team, the tester owned testing. So if you imagine the blue bubble is kind of all the test activity we do, we give something to the tester, they do their magic, and then it comes out the other side and it's tested. Ta-da! In Agile, we started to share ownership of this. So the blue bubble of testing suddenly started to include the other people in our development team. For some developers, this just means that people now care whether or not you're writing unit tests. Um, for others, it was something a little bit more robust, like you're truly owning quality of your product together. And DevOps is kind of stretching this even further. And here I'm talking about DevOps as a culture change, not as a role, where testing is now something that goes beyond our development teams. Like, we want to be using information that's available in our production environments through the operations people that have access to those systems. We want them involved in our test approach, um, and we want to be sharing with them what we're doing in our testing within delivery. So in this, in this diagram, when I talk to testers about this, and I'm saying testing and DevOps is like air. It's all around you, every role. And the testers will say, well, what am I supposed to do? If testing is everywhere, then why am I there? And I say to them that their role is to teach people to breathe continuously and naturally. But this is a different audience, because you're all the people that need to... when they're trying to tell you to breathe. Um, so you're the people that they're trying to coach, right? So there's an expectation that you're going to pick some of this up. So if you imagine learning to breathe in a new environment, say underwater, when you're learning to snorkel, I, I'm not really an underwater person, and this is a photo of me snorkeling, but I tend to get that feeling where I'm like, <laughs> I'm underwater, and I kind of panic a little bit, and I have to stick my head up um, to get my breath, and then I can keep going again. And it's, it's the same when you're kind of testing this way. Like, in a DevOps world where testing is all around and you're kind of learning to breathe it in, if you're doing one thing, one tool, that's going to work for a while. But what tends to happen is that you need to kind of stop, put your head above water, and like, <sighs> before you can keep going again. So examples. Um, you've got a lot of problems in production, so your organisation starts to implement extra governance steps for a period of time. It's like, oh, we should slow this down a bit so that everyone can breathe for a while and then we'll keep going. Or the people who have security testing sprints, where it's like, oh yeah, we weren't doing that all the time, let's just poke our head above the water and stop that whole DevOps thing for a while, do our security testing, and then like, put our head back down and keep going. But there comes a point, right, where it's not possible for you to do that anymore. Like, if you're really doing DevOps, if you're deep in that world, coming up for air isn't an option. And if you haven't learnt to breathe continuously and naturally in this environment, bad things are going to happen. So you really need to learn how to test instead of test. So the first thing I want to get you thinking about is the questions that you ask when you're looking at your products. So this is sort of like getting you moving around the beach. So Facebook. In 2014, Facebook were pushing tens to hundreds of diffs into their production environment every couple of hours. Um, they had automated tests, they had tiered releases, they had emergency stop buttons, they had employee dog fooding. Like, they're an organisation who are doing amazing things with their test approach. In the same year, so in 2014, Facebook released a new feature called Memories, 
where they would show you what you were doing on that day in previous years. Um, and they also released a thing called reviews that would summarise um, periods of time. So like at New Year, it would show you for the year. And those features started to show things like this. <laughs> so this is kind of amusing. Uh, this is her ex-boyfriend's apartment fire, which Facebook chose as the highlight of his year. Um, but there are, there are other things that happen with these algorithms that aren't so funny. So the next one is a person whose friend actually uh, committed suicide. He had posted about it on Facebook, and Facebook chose that as the thing that they were going to remind him of. So I'm not saying that Facebook's test approach is bad, right? What I want you to think about with this is how do you know that something's okay? Like, what questions are you asking of your product to decide that it's, it's good, that it's ready, that people can use it? Like, what is testing really to you? So I want you to think about a restaurant. It's a magic restaurant. You go to lunch at noon on Thursday, and you sit down and you enjoy your burger, fries, a milkshake, this is making me hungry. Um, and you spend an hour kind of enjoying your food, and you leave the restaurant at 1 o'clock. But it's 1 o'clock on Friday. So an hour has passed for you, but 25 hours has passed in the outside world. How do you know that's happened? So maybe you went to lunch, and the weather was awful, and you came out, and the weather was amazing. But if you live in Wellington, that doesn't really tell you anything. <laughs> Maybe you have 100 phone notifications. Potentially, you're a really popular person, and that doesn't mean anything either. Maybe you've got a parking ticket. Maybe you see a newspaper that's got a different date on it. Like, there's a bunch of ways that you could start to piece together something's weird here, something's gone wrong. So oracles are the principle or mechanism by which we recognize a problem. So they're the ways we tell something is wrong. And when we ask questions of our software, we're using oracles to figure out whether or not we see a bug, basically. So if you work in the development space, I'm going to propose that the question you ask most often of your software is, does it work how we think it should? So your spot on the beach is I want my acceptance criteria or my requirements. I want you to tell me how this is supposed to work. And then I'm going to test that it does that. And that might mean both positive and negative scenarios. It might mean functional and non-functional requirements. But it is, does it work how I think it should? And when we do this type of testing, when we ask this type of question, our oracle is biased to claims. So the requirements that people have are the claims that they're making about the software. And where, where I see people really focused in that testing space, does it work how we think it should? And they're trying to improve their testing. Basically, they're just trying to answer this question faster. So let's automate a pipeline that tells us, does it work how we think it should really quick? If you're working in the ops space, you're probably asking a slightly different question. Does it work how it usually works? So in this case, your bias towards history, your oracle is, is it consistent with what it's been doing previously? And what I think is interesting in the improvement space for this right now is that um, it feels like how it usually works, but with more cool stuff making it work that way. More dashboards that tell us that information. So dev, devs are focused on claims, ops are focused on history, but there's a lot of other ways to tell that our software is broken. So does it work the way that people actually want it to work? Like what's the user experience like? Does it work in a similar way to our competitors? Does it work the same way as similar uh, pieces of functionality in our own product? 
So if I'm developing a form, does it feel similar to other forms in our software? Does it meet its purpose without any harmful side effects? Does it meet legal ob obligations or statutes? So all of these questions or oracles can be summed up in a mnemonic. Uh, this one comes from a guy called Michael Bolton, not the singer. Uh, he's a tester, he's from Canada. Um, so HICCUP stands for History Image Comparable Products Claims, User Expectations, Product, Purpose and Statutes. And the reason that testers look at this type of prompt is to try and get them moving around, to start changing the questions that they're asking about software and to start evaluating problems differently. So I want to give you some examples. Say I'm developing a form for onboarding at a bank. So this is where someone comes to sign up um, to open an account. So if I'm in my development zone, I just want to test that this works, how it's supposed to work, right? Give me the user story or something so I can tick it off. So how about we flip our oracle and let's try and test this. Um, is, it, is it comparable to what our competitors are doing? So this is functionality to open an account. And you probably don't want to go and register to open an account with all of your competitor banks for a bunch of reasons. Um, but consultants have your back. So places like Deloitte, who were up here earlier, um, a lot of industries, they do these kind of industry uh, research, PDF summary things. And this one is one I randomly found on Google. It's from Luxembourg, of all places, and they have assessed kind of the digital banking offerings in Luxembourg. And you can see that onboarding is in their assessment criteria. They've got 17 criteria for a good onboarding process, and they kind of summarize it with these five bullet things. So if I'm a person in the development team who's working on this form, and I'm flipping my thinking, suddenly, my focus is not, does it do what we decided this should do? My focus is, how do we compare to what other people are doing? And suddenly the question of, is there a problem here, starts to yield some different answers, right? And I know that a bunch of you are like, this is why we have a BA. Um, it's everyone's job. So if you're, if you're in DevOps like you're diving underwater, you're getting to a point where you commit code, it's in production. And this is a question that your customers ask. How do you compare to your competitors? And if you're not asking it, between you chucking the code in and it being visible to them, who is? Another example, so this one is an ops thing. So this is our mobile internet banking platform. Um, sessions on two different days. So the top one is kind of a normal day and the bottom one is maybe a not so normal day. So if I'm looking at this through the traditional ops lens of does it work how it usually works, clearly no, right? Like those graphs are different, so something's going on. Um, but if I flip my oracle, I get a different answer here. So let's look at a comparable product on that same platform on the same day. So if I take the problem day for our mobile banking platform and I look at our web-based banking on that same period of time, they look pretty similar. And then suddenly I'm like, hmm, maybe there's not something wrong. Flip the oracle. Third and final example of this, so audit. This has been mentioned briefly in another talk. Um, I work at a bank, and we're owned by an Australian bank. And you might have heard about something called APRA, which is the reviews that the Australian banks are undergoing at the moment across all facets of the operation, but including IT. And I think audit is a really great example of where those snorkelers have to put their head above water and go like, <laughs> Um, because we kind of forget to ask continuously, does this meet our audit requirements? And then suddenly we're getting slammed of like, oh crap, does this meet our audit requirements? Um, I, there was a really great talk 
uh, at the WeTest conference a couple of weeks ago, so Renal, which I hopefully said correctly, um, presented about some work he's done around continuous compliance um, as part of their pipelines. And it was a really interesting presentation, and he has a demo about this too. And what I liked about this is that it's bringing the oracle of standards into the everyday um, discussions of this team. So we're not just thinking about, does this work how we think it should? We're also always thinking about, does this work how the standards say that it should? So oracles are about consistently pushing yourself to think differently about your product and to ask different questions. And what you might find with this is that these are some of the questions that your business asks. So they're the things that the business really care about, right? Like, are we compliant? What are our competitors doing? Is this really a problem or not? Um, and as you demonstrate that you're starting to think more widely like this, you can gain a lot of trust from the people who are stakeholders or customers to your team. So the other thing I want to encourage you to do is to start looking for answers in new places. So if we think back to that girl on the beach, she knows that she can find a certain type of shellfish by digging in that spot, right? And it's kind of the same in software. Like, if you've had to test something, you've kind of got your go-to favourite things to do, where you're like, oh, yeah, I found something like this last time. I can do this, and I know it's going to come, you know, I might get it again. But that doesn't mean that's the only place you can find that thing, right? So what I want to challenge you about is how can you look for those same types of problems in different ways? And I think this is where DevOps in particular, it really enables this type of change in thinking. And I see people talking about it, but I don't see that many people doing it. So we started here. Um, this is the testing pyramid or the test automation pyramid um, that was published in a book early 2000s by a guy called Mike Cohn. Uh, he wasn't a tester, he was an agile coach. And he published this pyramid, which most of you probably have some familiarity with, where he was saying, we want to have a lot of unit tests in our automated testing strategy because they're small and fast and stable. We want to have slightly fewer service or integration level tests and fewer still of our end-to-end -end tests or UI tests because they're kind of flaky. They take longer to run. We don't want them so much. So the testing community really loves kind of ripping this apart and has spent a decade drawing all different types of pictures. You might have seen ice cream cones. You might have seen little funny hourglass things. Um, and then last year, a guy in New York um, drew on a whiteboard in the middle of the night and posted on Twitter this, which gained quite a lot of traction. So this is the testing pyramid reimagined as a bug filter. And he was saying, hey, if you tipped every single thing that was wrong with your product in the top of this thing, unit tests would catch, you know, they could catch any of it. Integration tests are going to catch what that doesn't get and so on, until what you end up with in production, any bugs that make it that far, they're kind of functionally undetectable. And I really liked this because it shows the relationship between the layers in a way that the original pyramid didn't. But I also had a few problems with it. So my first thing about this is unit tests are really little and they catch little things. And end-to-end -end tests are big and catch bigger issues. And if you think about it, this is kind of backwards. So I'm thinking like Lego blocks, where you tip in all the Lego blocks and you shake the thing and the big stuff stays at the top and the smallest pieces fall to the bottom. It's like this kind of thing. So the, the mesh at the top has to have the widest gaps, right? Or nothing can get through to the next layer. And if you think about this as the model of how that filtering system would work, when you look at this again, you're like, wait, this is all backwards. Because if the unit tests are at the top, that's like the smallest mesh. So how does anything get any further? Like it would all get stuck there, right? The reason it doesn't is that this isn't a closed system. 
So the whole reason we do integration testing is that we're integrating with other things. So the bugs we find in integration aren't just the things that we missed in unit testing, they also come from other places that we have now integrated with. Um, and the same when we get down to production, it's not closed. Like we're switching environment, we're switching system. There's a whole bunch of new ways that bugs can appear there. My other objections with this, there's different types of bugs that we find. Like unit tests find really small problems. By the time you're finding an issue in an end-to-end -end test, it looks really big, even if the cause was something really small. And this still assumes that testing finishes at release. That when we hit production, we're no longer looking for problems. And in the DevOps world especially, that should not be true. So with all that in mind, here is where my head went. Amazing. So, let me explain. If you imagine the tests that you're choosing to automate as pieces of mesh. So when I'm writing unit tests, I'm writing a lot of unit tests. I'm trying to make a really fine-grained mesh. And my integration tests are covering a bigger piece of the system, but I have fewer of them. So there's, like, it's less mesh, but bigger coverage. And my end-to-end -end tests are the same again, right? I don't want so many of them, but they're kind of covering more. And then we're going to think about production. Because there's also test information available to us in our production environment. And once we hit production, that's a closed system. So our box is closed. And basically, it correlates, right? So our widest mesh in production are the alerts, the things that we're proactively told are problems. Our next layer is our monitoring, so the same as our kind of integration tests, where it's our dashboards or things we go and look for problems in. And then our logging is like our unit tests, that really granular information. When we tip all of the bugs in our software into this, they get trapped at different levels. And the types of bugs we find at those levels are different. So if I stop a problem in my unit testing mesh, I've probably found like a tiny egg of an issue in a piece of code. If it falls th further through, it can look like a slightly larger issue, right? And we're still going to find errors and warnings in our logs because there's opportunity for that stuff to get all the way down to the bottom. So in DevOps, when you're creating your test strategy, the conversation that you should be having in your teams is where do we want to put our mesh? Because we've now got access to three layers of box that we didn't have in the past. So we can start to have some really interesting conversations about how far can this bug fall? Like where can it get to? before the organisation starts to care that we didn't get this sooner. So does it really matter if I don't have an automated test at that integration layer, if I have a monitor that will detect that problem? Can I avoid writing a unit test if I put in some good logging? And these are the kind of conversations where initially people are going to be like, <laughs> no. Um, but the more you do it and the more you push against it, that's where you can really start to challenge what quality is for your product and how fast you can really go. So this all uh, might be too difficult to draw on the whiteboard with your team, so I'm going to give you the simple version, which is something like this. So if nothing else, uh, I'd love for you to go back to work and draw this up with your team and be like, hey, how much of that top bit is in our test strategy right now? Do we use any of this information in our test approach? And if not, why not? So I want to give you some examples of how you can look for answers in different places based on what I've been talking about. So developers, does it work how we think it should? You get really fixated on this so do testers, to be fair. Um, 
And in some respects, I think this is a symptom of development teams working in isolation, where you don't actually think about your ops team and the information they can provide that would help you answer this question. So what if, instead of answering that question pre-release, you answered it post-release? Will this work how we think it should? Turns out, no. So this is an example from Etsy. It's eight years old now. So this is not a new idea. Um, where they're using their monitoring as testing. And they've mapped out, this is when we're releasing, here is where errors are occurring. And this is really fast feedback, right? Like, I'd challenge you to find an automated test suite that runs in a pipeline pre-release that could tell you within 10 minutes that there was a problem like this and fix it. Um, so we're pushing risk here really late. And obviously, you don't want to do that with everything. Um, but I think we can probably do it a lot more often than we do now. Um, but it means that the development team have to actually work with the ops team to figure out what do these things look like. Like, how much stuff we can let fall through? Then we need to work with the people down here to put that mesh in so we can catch it. Another example. So, does this work how we think it should? Um, this is a button in our mortgages where if you've got a fixed interest rate, like a fixed term mortgage, fixed interest rate, and it's about to expire, you get this little button that says, hey, click here and refix your mortgage. And this is an old example now, but we used to um, convert 5% of our customers through this workflow, which is not great. Um, so how can we test that what we're doing to improve this is going to be better? So in a non-DevOps world, and arguably a non-Agile world, you might do some research and upfront stuff and try and get some requirements together and then basically do it and hope like hell that you had done the right thing. Um, what we do is A-B test. So we have a framework where instead of actually trying to figure out whether it's right at the start, we put in a bunch of different options and let the customers tell us whether it's right or not. And then productionize the version that works the best. So in this case, previously it was 5% of people um, that were being converted through this workflow. Uh, after we did our A-B testing, we got it up to eight which doesn't sound like much, but is a quite significant financial jump. So this kind of thing requires that same collaboration, right? Like you can't use your, so the development team has to implement the code in a way that they can actually have these options available. The ops team needs to understand what options are there and how to collect analytics about them and how to monitor the behavior of those different variants of the product. If you're not talking to each other, this just So does it work how it usually does? This monitoring question. Uh, with this, the way that you can ask differently is to start looking for problems proactively instead of reactively. And this has come up a few times already today. There was even an open space about this, uh, which is chaos engineering. So deliberately introducing problems into your production environment. And what I really liked, I went and kind of loitered at the edge of that open space. Um, and what I really liked was the person saying, you know, you pick something small. You start with something that you know. And you do it during daytime hours. You communicate well what's going to happen. And you have a go at it, right? Like, I, I would love to be having conversations at the executive level at my bank about doing some of this stuff. Um, because I think there's a real message there about the trust in our infrastructure and the trust in our operations capability that we're going to say, hey, for this period of time, we're going to try and do something we're pretty sure won't have any impact, but let's just check. And if it does have an impact, that's a good thing to discover, right? Because your customers are testing in production all the time. So why aren't you doing it too? So there's three things I want you to take from this. 
Number one, testing is part of your role. And if this is your job, then you need to improve your level of literacy to be doing it well. So if you assume that you're already a novelist, why do you think that? And if you're not already learning about testing, why not? I think testing is something that we should all be doing continuously and naturally. And as your DevOps practices mature, you're not going to have the option to be able to come up for air. Like, you have to be breathing all the time. You have to be thinking about this. Change the questions that you ask. So what, what is broken to you may not be what is broken to your customers or your stakeholders. So start asking the same questions that they are. How do you compare to your competitors? How do you meet your obligations of your industry, your standards? How do you compare with other products in your organisation? If all you're doing is testing, you need to start thinking about testing. So I would like you to get the hiccups, explore testing as a discipline, and start asking some different things. And finally, I'd really love it if you would all look for answers in new places. So DevOps is opening up this world of opportunity for us to be using different types of information in our testing. This is a great, like, you can go pick up different sticks. We have alerting, monitoring, and logging information there. We have the organisational culture that's bringing together development and operations and enabling you to test in different ways, to go faster, to challenge where risk is being addressed. So are you really taking advantage of that? Or are you still just testing that it works how you think it should and throwing it over the fence? If you'd like to know more about this, I have written a book about testing in DevOps. It's published on LeanPub. If you move the slider, you can get it for free. You cheap people. <laughs> um, I'm also available on Twitter and LinkedIn, and I will be around later tonight and tomorrow if you do have any questions. Thank you.